Um, next, we have public comments. <clears throat> so these are the rules. In-person speakers will proceed first. They'll be called on by the board secretary. Remote speakers will proceed next. They will be admitted to the meeting by an HCPS staff member when it is their turn to speak. All speakers will receive three minutes, but we do have two groups identified tonight who will each receive five minutes. Um, speakers may be interrupted and given notice when they have 30 seconds left when speakers have reached their three minute mark. And again, the group five minute mark, their time will expire. Mrs. Rollo, will you please begin with in-person registered speakers? Yes, this evening we have a total of 16 in-person speakers. The first one is Mr. Benjamin Heiser, followed by James Ramsey. Good evening. My name is Benjamin Heiser. Um, the latest decision on the contract for classroom libraries for uh, $265,000 has been nothing short of disgusting. The only board member that read through the book list was Melissa Hahn. Even Wade Sewell said that he saw it but didn't even care to look through it. You all voted on books K through 5 classroom libraries. If any one of you would have read the book list, you would have found that there are plenty of racially diversive and sexually promiscuous books within this purchase. Why do these need to be in K through five? With the latest test scores, they may be considered high school books for some. Let's take a quick, small look at a sample of these books. So we have the Black Lives Matter movement. We have equality and social justice, protests, Colin Kaepernick, uh, athletes who make a difference, though he hasn't been one since 2016. The Witch Boy, Who is Rand Paul, protests, places to protest, sit in a nonviolent protest for, for racial equality. I'd like to inform, um, I'd like the board to inform the parents, taxpayers, voters, constituents, why these books are necessary from kindergarten through fifth grade. Why my first grader needs to know how to protest. If somebody can please explain that to me, I would love to know why, not to mention why they think it's okay. My daughter is taught that the principal is in charge. The teacher is in charge. Authority, respect, 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 respect. The principal at my elementary school will tell you, I call him Mr. Principal every time so my daughter understands respect. There, <laughs> there's no protesting between K, K through five, at least there shouldn't be. And if there is, then, we, then we're all, all at fault, every one of us. If we have a kindergartner through fifth grade doing a sit-in protest, it's ridiculous. Um, uh, Carol Pripp, uh, Pitt Bruce said the children needed classroom material, but I, I failed to see a majority of that being classroom material. In fact, I only saw 5% of it being classroom material. Um, with all that taken into consideration, I would really like for the BOE to please provide us a reasonable explanation as to why these kind of books are made for kindergartners through, first, I mean, through fifth graders. Thank you very much. I'm James Ramsey. Um, there was a story in the New York Post that's relevant to some of our own controversies about what books should be in our school libraries. The headline reads, 11-year-old reads aloud from, quote, pornographic, unquote, book he checked out from library at school at a board meeting. The book in question was Nick and Charlie, about two 14-year-old boys, quote, experimenting, unquote, and the kid who read a passage from it was with his dad who went on to protest another book that most of us have probably heard of by now, Gender Queer. Here's the odd thing though. Both father and son decried this book as pornographic, yet he's not only willing to have it read at a school board meeting, but to let his kid read it. 
that book were something that everyone in this room would recognize as pornography, like, say, whatever they're selling in those sketchy bookstores on Route 40, or some of the more <clears throat> interesting fan fiction about Kirk and Spock you can find on the internet, and probably don't want to, I can guarantee that that would never have happened. That's a sign that the book that they were talking about isn't quite the dangerous corruptor that they say it is. In this controversy, a lot of conservatives throw around the word pornography the way liberals often throw around the phrase white supremacy, in a way that dilutes the meaning, adds more heat than light, and makes a hash of any constructive discussion on the topic. If we're going to talk about the suitability of material with adult themes, maybe you ought to start talking about it like adults. Thank you. Next we have Josh Kojal. Um, can you please state the name of your group and you will receive five minutes. Um, good evening. My name is Josh Kozel and I represent uh, We the People of Maryland. We are, our, our, where our mission is to advocate for your right to control your livelihood, your property, your family, and your destiny. Our vision is to provide an organized outlet for Americans who are frustrated by government overreach. I'm not sure if you, as the Board of Education, know this, but you have only one employee, and that's Dr. Bolson. I state this because when watching these meetings, it seems to be the opposite, that he controls you. Each of you has the responsibility of re representing your constituents, not protecting Dr. Bolson and his employees. Repeatedly, Dr. Bolson, his attorneys, and staff come before you to dictate what you will do. That is not how this system works. I know that I have been vocal for years about the destruction that is being caused by Dr. Bolson and have asked for his removal many times. Please note that you, as the Board of Education, are responsible for his continued destruction to this county. And it is my understanding, by regulation, it takes only one of you to identify and, or recognize that there is a problem and initiate an investigation with the State Board of Education. That is why I'm here tonight. Ms. Alvarez, Mr. Soule, Ms. Perry, Ms. Bruce, and Ms. Blanken. I'm not sure if you are aware of what I'm about to discuss, but the rest of you most likely are from sitting on this board, of, uh, board, of, board or hearing about it through the community engagement. On April 20th, 2022, I sent the following to Ms. Neal. Pursuant to Maryland Public Information Act Title IV, general provision to the Maryland Code, I am requesting the document members received as a PDF email attachment, specifically October 14th, 2021, memorandum to ILT re sexual orientation inquiries, inquiries of students made by school staff regarding a student's gender identity or sexual orientation. I received a response on April 28th, 2022, from Ms. Neal stating that the memo I requested does exist, but would not be provided to me because it was privileged and confidential. I then responded asking for the agenda, the minutes, notes, exhibits, and or attachments the instru instructional leadership team meeting held on September 3rd, 2022, or excuse me, 2021. On May 10th, 2022, Ms. Neal responded, stating that the board does not have any documents to support my request for an agenda, minutes, exhibits, and or attachments. In addition, I was advised that there are documents that support my request for any notes, but once again, I was denied access. Long story short, I implore each one of you to review the memorandum sent to the instructional leadership team by Patrick P. Spicer Esquire on October 14th, 2021, with the following subject lines. Inquiries of students made by school staff regarding a student's gender identity or sexual orientation. And two, disclosure by school staff to parent and, of a student's gender identity or sexual orientation. This will begin to illustrate the illegal and immoral activity orchestrated by Dr. Bolson and his staff. There are plenty of other supporting facts and examples, like the presentations teachers received on LGBT instruction, which Alex uh, Schemmel of the National Desk obtained through MI, or MPIA request. During these presentations, staff played out scenarios for teachers regarding the disclosure of students' identity to their parents. Second, the getting to know you surveys and the classwork that has been placed in our classrooms. Third, the direct denial from sitting Board of Education members um, to local elected officials just a few months before 
these, uh, this memo went out denying that this was happening in our schools. And it, this person's still sitting on this board today. And finally, social media and community uh, communications that provide direct examples of it happening right here in our schools. In closing, I ask that this be done with transparency and that the community is not only allowed access to the information, but also your discussion and decisions. It can start tonight. Will one of you ask him um, what this is about? Has he been involved? Or is his staff been involved with asking gender ideation questions beyond a biological reference? And has it been discussed and trained on how to withhold from the parents? Lastly, what did the last attorney for Dr. Bolson, Mr. Spicer, state in this memo? And did he comply? As mentioned before, it only takes one of you to understand the severity of the situation and initiate a formal review and hopefully the removal of Dr. Bolson from his powerful position over so many children in our community. Good evening and thank you. Next we have Lindsay Greenbaum followed by Jennifer Selke. Good evening. My name is Lindsay Greenbaum and I am the reading specialist at Jarrettsville Elementary as well as a parent in HCPS. It has been said that we need to teach children how to read and not just to love reading. I can assure you that the work we do in the classroom achieves both. Children are learning to read in an engaging and authentic way. Our children are tasked to become word detectives and word builders by receiving missions to promote phonics discoveries. They receive slider power and vowel power to emulate the superpowers of their favorite superheroes. And yes, these changes directly align with the science of reading. Our kindergartners and first graders are talking about blends, digraphs, vowel teams, and of course, those rule breakers. Decoding texts are in hands and children are reading. Our older students are taking charge of their own reading and literacy life. They are engaging in debate they are engaged in debating real-world issues, running their own book clubs and research clubs, and advocating for possible change. Their jots and writings in response to reading include making claims, supporting details with their thinking, and stating themes. They are successfully engaged in a large volume of sustained reading. Our teaching is structured so that the teacher is not doing the too familiar stand and deliver format. As we move forward looking at what instruction is best for our students, please be mindful that this type of learning will not be accomplished in a workbook. Instead, teachers are working endlessly to make sure the needs of every reader are addressed through intentional small groups, expl explicit instruction, and carefully selected materials to provide students with repeated practice within their zone of proximal development. The Reading English Language Arts Office has strategically planned professional development to ensure we have shifted some of our old practices and continue to follow the science of reading. The reading specialists at the building level are also addressing professional development to ensure we are continuing those efforts. Our collective goal is that we are growing teachers as teachers of reading. At the last board meeting, it was asked what it would take to get to 100% proficiency. Time. We need time to bring our students through the scope and sequence of this systematic program we are still recovering from the damage done during the pandemic. Two years ago, we were considered heroes during virtual teaching. I promise you the hardest work we have put forth has been the work we have completed since the doors reopened. Consistency in instruction is most important as we continue to fill the gaps created in the past few years. We are on the right track. I can report that as of the middle of the school year, 98% of our kindergartners and 96% of our first graders are proficient and advanced in Dibbles. These are the students who have completed our units of study curriculum with fidelity. Everyone here has a mutual belief that we must do what is best for students. Give us the time we need to teach in the way that we know how. Thank you. Good evening, Dr. Bolson and board members. My name is Jennifer Selke and I'm the reading specialist at Emerton Elementary School. I'm here tonight to continue to share about the literacy instruction that is happening within our county. This is our third year implementing units of study and reading and second year implementing phonics units of study. While this is not our first year of implementation, it is our first year without COVID restrictions and it is our first year implementing the updated reading units of study. 
The last time I addressed the board, I shared about the shifts that are being made so that our literacy instruction aligns with the science of reading. I shared about the use of decodable text, orthographic mapping, the elimination of the queuing system, the use of a phonics continuum, and the addition of the Hegarty Phonemic Awareness Program. Tonight, I'd like to share a few more shifts that are happening during literacy instruction. Before units of study, the number one complaint I heard from teachers is that they could not get their students to apply and transfer what they were learning in the phonics block to their reading and writing. Since implementing the phonics units of study, teachers are now seeing this transfer, which is crucial, since we know that phonics is a bridge to building stronger readers and writers. The reading, writing, and phonics units of study are aligned beautifully to allow this transfer to happen. This shift in alignment has allowed students to understand that what helps them as readers also helps them as writers, and what helps them as writers also helps them as readers. And most of all, they understand that what they learn in phonics makes them stronger readers and writers, not stronger phonics students. Before units of study, small group instruction looked different. We would teach the same skill or strategy to all students, only differentiating with the text that we use. We are shifting away from this guided reading approach. Now we use assessments to create effective and individualized small groups that target specific needs to move students forward as readers and writers. These shifts do take time, but they are happening. I recently heard on a podcast that we need to give schools and teachers grace as we begin to make these shifts that are more aligned with science of reading. As mentioned, this is the first year that any school in the county is implementing phonics, writing, and the updated K-2 reading units of study. Giving up on this curriculum after less than a year and having teachers learn a brand new program doesn't feel like grace to me. In conclusion, I'd like to remind you that we are teaching students to read. We are teaching students to read words using their phonics knowledge and no longer using the cueing system. And we are building a love for reading. I've heard people recently say that they don't want their child to love to read, they want their child to learn to read. Well, I have a three-year-old at home. And when she gets to school, I truly hope that she has a teacher that helps her learn to read, but also continue to instill her love for reading. In my opinion, learning to read and loving to read go hand in hand. Can't we, shouldn't we be doing both? Thank you for your time. Next we have Kristen Duraka followed by Charlene Hott. Good evening. My name is Kristen Drachka, and I come before you tonight to share my experiences with the reading program as a Harford County Re Public Schools reading specialist, an educator of 26 years in multiple districts, and a parent. I'd like to discuss how we are incorporating the science of reading into our curriculum. First and foremost, according to Dr. Timothy Shanahan, a leading researcher and professor from the University of Illinois at Chicago, the science of reading incorporates any pedagogical approach that has a proven track record of improving achievement over multiple studies. Not only does this mean phonemic awareness and phonics instruction, but also fluency, vocabulary development, comprehension, and writing. All six of these principles must be included in a quality English language arts program in order for students to achieve the ultimate goal of reading, which is making meaning. The first two principles, phonemic awareness and phonics, were discussed last board meeting by the REAL office, so I'm not going to, do, to dwell on those, but go into the less commonly discussed parts of the science of reading. Fluency. Research has shown that instruction in fluent reading strategies improves decoding and reading comprehension in addition to fluency. This is best done through reading texts aloud with feedback, feedback and repetition in paired readings, repeated readings, echo readings, and other ways. Because we have time for small group instruction and partner work in our schedule, this type of practice can occur. Comprehension and vocabulary development go hand in hand. Hand in hand. Again, through research, through research, it's been proven that vocabulary building is best done with connections to text. We are able to do this because of read aloud time where students can build vocabulary using grade level text. Research has also proven that it is not effective to teach comprehension strategies in isolation, but rather through a rich text and using multiple strategies at once. Again, we are able to do this and analyze our student progress through small group instruction. Another best practice of comprehension instruction is to have a progression of skills. Our curriculum provides us a framework with which to do this. Through pre-assessment and formative assessment data, we can determine where students fall along a continuum 
and make next steps to have students make the progress. We are meeting students where they are to provide them with opportunities to, meet, to move forward more quickly. I'm going to skip over for writing now in the interest of time, but I want you to know that in addition, we follow research-based intervention practices when students are not meeting grade level expectations. This is not unique to our current reading curriculum because there is not one program that works for all students. What I'd like you to take away from this is that there is more to the science of reading than just phonemic awareness and phonics and that the Hartford County Public School Structured Reading, Language, and Arts program is following all of the science of reading. Thank you. I am a former teacher, also as a librarian for two of those 37 years, 18 of them in Harford County Public Schools. I thank you for allowing me to address the issue of our school and public libraries. I'm referring to all libraries, both public and school-based, as our children use them both. A program of FBI intervention in the 1970s and 80s was a false flag named the FBI Library Awareness Program. It is about choice and lack of it as well. This failed program can be found on any fact-based website concerning intellectual freedom. It appears that today, in 2023, some are taking a page out of the tactics of the FBI and using them for an assault on libraries, especially school libraries, all over our country and counties. One big difference is that school boards and government offices, as well as the children who learn from books, are being used as a foil to make censorship a defining goal. They will tell you it's for the safety of our children, the confidence they require to believe in the professionalism and credibility of their child's teacher. They are using this issue for their own purposes to identify, censor, and remove any books or materials their group may see as objectionable in their minds to their parenting, their patriotism, and their government standards. It's a hard thing to prove they are wrong or that their efforts are hurting our children, even those in colleges and universities. The damage is done by banning any book from accredited libraries, whether in schools or our town library facilities, are irredeemable. Censorship of the written word and our educational standards is not only harmful, but it has also been used for centuries as a tool to limit knowledge that goes against their grain and means to establish a power hold on our governments. It is and always has been the first step in eliminating ideas they are against. Censorship devalues knowledge, unlimited ideology, and free expression of ideas. They are politically entrenched in this without actual proof those censored written words are harmful. Every child deserves an education, they will argue. It seems it must only be their ideas of education. Some of the ideas they protest are the very foundations of our country, freedom of speech, expression of a knowledge base that may go beyond the ideas of some of their peers or even their parents. Those unfamiliar ideas are scary to some parents and cause for action, even if it's harmful to their own children. It's not about our culture specifically, but it affects all cultures, ethnic groups, and all ages. Our children will in time leave the comfort of their homes and realize it's a small fraction of the wide world they will enter as they grow older. And remember what is on our coinage, e pluribus unum, out of many, one. I would respectfully ask that ideas submitted towards censoring our teacher libraries and using false information that defies reason would be soundly refused by our Board of Education, the operative word be here being education, not lack of it. Thank you. Next we have Susan Nas, followed by Wendy Morelli. Hi, good evening. My name is Sue Knaus, and I'm one of the founders of the Upper Chesapeake Bay Pride and past president. I'm a member of the Unitarian Universalist Fellowship of Hartford County. I work full time for the VA, and I'm a lesbian. But my most important role is mother to my fifth grade son at Haber de Grace Elementary School, where he attends, where I live, where I own a home, and where I pay taxes. And I'm deeply concerned about the rhetoric and the language and the inflammatory uh, rhetoric around uh, banning books, about 
who we are as a community, as the LGBTQ community. And I want to make sure that you understand that we're here and we see you and we have children in your schools. Uh, my son is the child of two mothers. He should not be harassed or bullied as a result of the rhetoric that he hears or that's influenced the board or members. There are children in the school system that self-identify as LGBTQ+, and they should not be harassed or bullied as a result of that. The number one job of the school board, first and foremost, is to provide a safe environment for our children to be educated. They hear your language. They feel your discomfort with who they are. LGBTQ youth are four times more likely to commit suicide. LGBTQ people are five times more likely to have addiction issues. And I'm personally asking you, on behalf of my son and other youth that may identify as LGBTQ, to please consider the inflammatory and misinformed rhetoric that you're hearing that's influencing banning books, taking information away from them. Every day I walk my son to school, I kiss him as much as he'll let me as a fifth grader, and I tell him I love him, and I tell him be good, be kind, be compassionate, and do your very best. So tonight, I'm asking all of you to be good, be kind, be compassionate, and do your very best because they're watching you and they're hearing you. And so thank you and good night. Good evening, Dr. Bolson and members of the board. I would like to begin by saying thank you for voting yes to purchasing the decodable books. Those books are essential to our reading small groups and our reading workshop time. I would like to begin with some background information about me so you can understand the importance I place on the teaching of literacy, as well as the importance of using facts and research to determine my best practices. I'm currently a kindergarten teacher at Emerton. I've been in the field of education in some way for 20 plus years. I have a master's degree in elementary education and I'm certified to teach grades K to five. I'm a national board certified teacher in the area of early and middle childhood literacy. I'm now working towards a master's in trans transformational leadership. As you can see, I'm fully immersed in education and best practices, especially in the area of literacy. Last time I spoke, I compare what literacy looks like in my classroom using the units of study to the research supported by the science of reading. I am hopeful that the comparison I gave cleared up the confusion that the units of study is not aligned with the science of reading. The revised reading and the phonics unit of study does align with the science of reading. My purpose tonight is to challenge the board. According to the National School Boards Association, a Board of Education member represents the community's voice in public education. To represent the community's voice, you must hear both sides of any issue. Two weeks ago, the Rila Department shared data with you that showed promise. The group that is most vo vocal about the units of study did not even stay to hear the data. They had made up their minds without hearing all of the facts. It is your job to hear all of the facts. And I would like to thank the board members who have already begun answering questions and coming to see the units of study in classrooms. You should be asking questions so that you can fully understand both sides of the issue at hand. Does the units of study reflect the science of reading and will the curriculum increase our students' capacity as readers? Before you make any decisions regarding piloting new reading and phonics curriculum, purchasing new curriculum, you must understand both sides of the issue. To understand this, you must ask questions. You must speak to the educators and see what it looks like in the classrooms. I know that many of you have been invited into the classrooms and I encourage you to take advantage of that. Reach out to all types of schools. Go in the classrooms to witness the science of reading that is happening right now. If you choose not to, you are only hearing one side of the issue and that is not what you've been tasked with as a member of the Board of Education. In closing, I ask that instead of pouring money into new curriculum, give the current curriculum the time necessary to show growth. Instead of pouring money into new curriculum, use the money to ensure that schools have more than one reading specialist to support teachers in the area of teaching literacy. Ensure that schools have interventionists to support the struggling readers. Provide funding to add more literacy coaches and literacy specialists 
and ensure that new teachers have the support needed to teach literacy effectively. Finally, reach out to teachers to see what teaching literacy looks like so that you understand both sides of the issue. Thank you. Next, we have Stella Peters, followed by Betsy Steinen. Good evening. Three years ago today on March 13th, on Friday, March 13th, 2020, my husband and I sat on those school bleachers watching my then high school senior play his first and what we didn't know then, his last lacrosse game. The class of 2020 are victims of wrongdoing, an unjust, unfair, and corrupt government system. These young students were told that they had to sacrifice their senior year for the greater good. They were shamed by teachers, administrators, the government, and social media if they complained or expressed sadness with the fact that they would not be able to participate in sports, prom, or even graduate with their peers. They didn't have the opportunity to celebrate their accomplishments that they had worked so hard for in the last four years, and they didn't get the opportunity to say goodbye to their teachers and friends. Fast forward to today, we know their sacrifice was all in vain. According to a study by Johns Hopkins University, they stated that lockdowns had little to no public health benefits. They imposed enormous economic, social costs. Job losses in March and April of 2020 exceeded 22 million and have not yet been fully recovered. Children lost years of educational and social development that will affect them for the rest of their lives. The disruption, stress, and isolation of the pandemic resulted in a spike in behavioral and mental health issues among students nationally. Data has proven that academics declined at a, at a very alarming rate as psychological problems soared here in Hartford County and throughout our society. It's hard to disagree with the Hopkins researchers' con conclusion that lockdowns should be rejected as a pandemic policy instrument. What's worse is that Hartford County was 50th in the country to reopen their schools. Those who voted and chose to keep our children locked down contributed to the damage placed on our children, and they are guilty of child abuse. Even as we learn of these harmful effects, the HCPS Board of Education continues to make uninformed decisions that are encouraging division, violence, depression, and confusion in our schools. By blindly voting for pornographic books, they are sexualizing young, innocent minds. Students are taught that they are either oppressed or they are the oppressors. Our youth feels hopeless and without a future. If this board spent more time researching and doing what is right instead of disrespecting fellow board members, maybe we could just get something good done. But today, I just want to tell the youth and children of Hartford County that there is hope through Jesus Christ Hold on to Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Never forget. Good evening. You may or may not remember me from the last board meeting. My name is Betsy Steinen, and I'm a kindergarten teacher at Emerton Elementary School. I wanted to publicly thank you for approving the funding for more books for our kiddos. My little ones love when I can exchange their books in their book baggies, and we can, can only continue to do this with more books. Buying more books for schools is just something that will always be in need in this county, in any county. So for this, I thank you. I'm also here to address a different concern. Over the past few months, I've really been struggling with the comments and quite frankly, the questioning of how we teach. There's a lot of talk right now in the media regarding the best reading program for our students. People are throwing data around from all sides and have their own opinions. We are lucky to live in a country where we can all freely express our opinions and still get along with our neighbors. I may not always agree with you and vice versa, but we can still be friendly. I teach my K-babies this every day. When listening to the conversations regarding the best reading program for kids, people are forgetting two important facts. 
Students are more than numbers, and teachers are more than numbers. We are all individuals who come from various backgrounds with varying needs. The way people are discussing these programs make it seem like anyone could stand in front of a group of kiddos and deliver the information. That is simply demoralizing to our profession. The number one priority of teachers is to make sure their kiddos feel safe, secured, and loved. No curriculum or program can be delivered if this is not set in place. We look at each child as an individual, not as a group. Students learn differently, and it is up to us, the teachers, to find the best way to reach each child. Programs and curriculums are important as they help us reach the needs of our kids, but by themselves aren't as effective as when they are delivered by trained professionals, us, the teachers. I don't walk into a doctor's office and tell them how I want my gallbladder removed. It's not my area of expertise. I can read all the different options out there, but ultimately, the doctor is the professional and expert in that field. For some reason, teachers are not given the same respect. I will never understand this. We may be the best teachers around, but without support from home, we are not miracle workers. No one program is going to fix a child's needs. This comes from teachers who truly know their kiddos and working with families, not against them. All of this is being stated to reinforce the fact that teachers are professionals and the students reap the benefits of when we are working with families, with communities, and with board members. Thank you for your time. Our next speaker is Delane Lewis, who will receive five minutes. Can you please state the name of your group? Hello, good evening everybody. Delane Lewis with Together We Will. I'm here tonight to speak in reference to the threat assessment policy. The policy references a manual which I have not had the opportunity to read, so my comments are just in reference to the policy as written in the agenda. It's imperative that all policies be evaluated with consideration for the safety and well-being of all those potentially impacted, teachers, staff, students, non-HP, HCPS individuals who may be on the premises, etc. I'm bothered by the change in the policy to include the school resource officer on the threat assessment team. The way that I read the policy means that the SRO could be involved in all aspects of the threat assessment, including questioning, or once you bring a police officer into it, it would really be more like interrogation. Um, and that's, you know, that's very concerning to me. Once a police officer is involved, we are dealing with questions of, is this person or child in custody? Should they be read their rights? Are parents or guardians being notified before the questioning by the SRO? There's already well-documented data that students of color, LGBTQIA students, and disabled students are disciplined at higher rates than their white, non-queer, non-disabled counterparts and that there is a direct correlation between being targeted for school discipline and incarceration rates. This is why many are skeptical of the benefits of a school resource officer on the school campus. It makes it too easy to turn over what should be a school disciplinary matter to the police. Previously, we'd been assured that there was a clear delineation of the responsibilities, and the SROs themselves were frustrated that they were being asked to inappropriately become involved in school disciplinary matters. And now here we are. The threat assessment team members, it says, I'm quoting from the policy, uh, the threat assessment members shall receive periodic training regarding implicit bias, disability, and diversity training with special attention to racial and ethnic disparities. This language is tacked on as an afterthought at the end of the policy and instead should be included in the required training provisions under the triage section. I mean, how periodic are we talking? It's very vague. Um, why aren't de-escalation strategies mentioned? Why aren't mediation of disputes, either through the school system or bringing in outside county resources mentioned? I just feel like there are a lot of concerns with the threat assessment policy. I have a lot of concerns with the SROs uh, being included uh, in, from the beginning and how that might escalate 
uh, problems and uh, disciplinary consequences for our students. That's my main comment that I wanted to make. I will also just tack on something about curriculum. Um, I'm no curriculum specialist. I'm no teacher. I have the greatest respect for teachers and what they do. I think as a parent, as a member of the school community, as a taxpayer, we're certainly entitled to ask the question, is the curriculum that's being used the best one available? It's concerning to me that there are lawsuits involving this curriculum. It's concerning to me that most of the comments of the people who got up here said that the curriculums have now been corrected to include phonetic education and now it's working. So why are we dealing with a curriculum program that needs that kind of adjustment? And I don't know, maybe that adjustment was sufficient. I can't weigh in. I think that the people who came and spoke tonight, I'm sure are amazing teachers, as evidenced by their devotion and their willingness to come tonight and speak. And when you have an amazing teacher, they can do amazing things even with curriculums that have holes in them. But once again, we come back to the question, you have children that are well supported in their homes and they're gonna learn to read no matter what the holes are in the curriculum. The question is, what about the children that don't have that? That is what you need to be asking when you're looking at this curriculum. And if you can give us a good answer about that, I definitely wanna hear it. But to me, that's where we are. Where are the students who are gonna fall through the cracks if, the, if you don't have a great teacher and you have a curriculum that has flaws. Thank you. Zoe Peller followed by Noni Zoka. Good evening and thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak to you all tonight. My name is Zoe Peller, and I'm a Harvard County resident that graduated from C. Milton Wright High School in 2020. Despite going away for college, I have been following the Board of Ed meetings for some time and have been frustrated with the comments made by members of our community about LGBTQ plus students. As a queer person who came out in high school, I would be nothing without the support of my teachers, my guidance counselors, and my administrators. The experiences I had as a queer teenager were ones that I don't wish on anyone else, and the hateful rhetoric heard at these meetings continue the spread of anti-LGBTQ plus attacks. To those of you who want to ban children from identifying with the gender that they align with, sharing their pronouns, or reading books that represent them, you are pushing these children to repress themselves to fit into the boxes that you find more acceptable. Sheltering students from diverse, inclusive education about their identities, the identities of others, and the constitutional right to protest and stand up for what they believe in only harms them. The most important factor in a queer child's success is a support system, and if that's not something parents can provide, teachers should be praised for stepping up and supporting them. I ask that you stop and think about the impact your hate speech has on our LGBTQ plus kids, and what message you're sending children who just wanna be who they really are. Thank you. I'm gonna do show and tell tonight. These are just a few of the books that this administration and board approved to be purchased. Some I was not available to get at the public library because they were checked out. Love, Violet, a so-called child-friendly romance about two first grade students. Pride Puppy, who is RuPaul, an introduction to drag queens. And my favorite for the elementary school, since I've been an elementary school teacher, is A is for activist, teaching ABCs. L is for LGBTQ+, T is for transgender, and Z is for Zapatista, who, if you don't remember, is a far-left Mexican terrorist group. K-1 students have no idea what these things are. What happened to A is for apple and B is for boy? The next two books I'm going to show you are for middle and high school. They're very graphic. So please do not have me removed for reading these because if you want our children to read them, why can't they be read at a school board meeting? Flamer, boys watching porn at camp, 
boys, M-A-S-T-U-R-B-A-T-I-N-G, together and ejaculating in a bottle. Let's talk about it. I will read from this book, and I'll tell you that it explicitly explains how male and females, M-A-S-T-U-R-B-A-T-E, it gives instructions to children how to text. I am embarrassed to read these, but you have forced us to bring this to the light of day. I know it's sex when a penis goes inside a vagina, but what about other stuff like oral sex or hand jobs and fingerling? Do these things count as sex or are they, I don't know, they're only a subcategory? What if you're rubbing someone's junk through their pants and they get off, but you never actually touch their skin? Is that sex or not? And there are some graphic pictures in this book that you have put into the hands of our students. Teaching boys how to M-A-S-T-U-R-B-A-T-E, stroke the shaft with different pressures and speeds, try mixing up your grip or switch hands, whack it against your palm or give it some bending pressure. I'm embarrassed to read any more. But this administration and board rejected Tim Scott's book, A Black Man Who Came From Nothing, a, a Single Parent. But I guess you rejected it because it had no sex, gender ideology, or SEL. I'm embarrassed that I had to do this. Martino, followed by Janine Canito. Oh, I wish I had that kind of courage. Good evening. In December of 2022, members of Congress were given the omnibus bill that contained thousands of pages of legislation and budgetary issues. They were told if you don't sign it by midnight, the federal government will shut down. So many members signed it without the ability to read it. Two weeks ago, I witnessed the Harford County Public Schools System's version of this by sending a list of books for purchase to the board members a few hours before the vote. This was deliberate and unethical. The expression dirty, underhanded, sneaky trick comes to mind. Speaking of Congress, in 2019, Nancy Pelosi and the Democrats raised the legal age for sale of all tobacco products, including vape, snuff, and chew, from 18 to 21 years of age, known as the Tobacco 21 Laws. The Democrats justified it by claiming that the human brain is not mature enough at the age of 18 to make decisions that affect their health. However, the same group of Democrats advocate for a preteen child, some as young as nine years old, to make the decision to change their gender. Joe Biden said that eight-year-olds can be transgender. This is the logic of the loony left. So let's get this straight. A 20-year-old who returns from Afghanistan can't consume a pinch of chew because he is mentally immature but a preteen can decide to have gender reassignment surgery that carves up their little bodies and permanently destroys their reproductive system from ever reproducing. Then take puberty blockers and hormone therapy drugs that will, will wreak havoc on their kidneys and liver. Logic of the loony left. Dr. Abreno, the chief of pediatric emergency medicine at Vanderbilt Medical Center, has reported that preteens and teenagers are constantly performing risky behaviors such as the choking game, the cinnamon challenge, the salt and ice challenge, chubby bunny, and the car surfing challenge. How about hanging over the edge of a cliff or a building to capture that perfect selfie? Or Facebook living yourself driving over 100 miles per hour weaving through traffic? Or filming yourself from falling from a high elevation does this sound insane? Well, yes, it is. 
because these acts are done by a brain that doesn't have the mental maturity to make good decisions, but is driven by emotions. Children are unable to make life-changing decisions. HCPS should reject all policies and educational material that promotes transgenderism. Protect our children. Thank you. Good evening. Um, I'm Janine Canito. I live in Forest Hill. Um, I am the mother of a trans son who was in college and loved by our entire family and supported. So um, you can come at me with the transphobe rhetoric all you want. I'll debate you till the cows come home. In the next three minutes, I will highlight just how crazy our world has become. Um, many of you visited schools, as you talked about. I didn't hear one of you say you visited school libraries to see what was in there, what we are all so concerned about. Um, I also heard a lot of feedback from reading specialists. Y'all are out in force tonight. Um, I have never seen or heard from any of you at a board meeting in the past. And I find your uh, recent zeal in participation very curious, much like the attendance of other groups who have spontaneously attended Board of Ed meetings when the Board of Ed is under fire for various issues. Um, some of the things I want to talk about is um, I recently watched a mom testify before Congress in support of the current parental, bill, current parental rights bill. This mom was threatened by local teachers union and her life has been made hell. I, that leads me to believe what are folks hiding because she wanted to find out what curriculum her kindergarten was being taught. Another thing is citizens in our community are using intimidation taxes, tactics against those who differ in political opinions. They include cyber stalking of parents and their children I was personally threatened by a Facebook user saying she would report me to the Board of Nursing for ethical misconduct or violations or something, and I'm sure she's listening. I'm sure she'll chime in after this, you know who you are. Um, that is unacceptable, and the Sheriff's Department is aware. Another thing, CRT proponents insist it's necessary, opponents, it teaches racism. Not that long ago, I reached out to the NAACP president uh, to invite to discuss mutual interests and agenda, and their response was, we're busy, we're all volunteers, but thank you for your interest in becoming anti-racist. I told them at best it was presumptive, at worst that was a really racist comment to make to me. Your time is up. President Mueller, that's all the in-person comments. Ms. Slater, would you please uh, begin any virtual speakers? Yes, thank you. Good evening. You are now in the Board of Education meeting. Before you begin your public comment, please state your first and last name. Your time will conclude in three minutes. You will hear a bell ring when you have 30 seconds remaining. Please introduce yourself and you may begin your public comment now. Good evening, I'm David Bauer, and tonight I'm going to talk about school performance and ratings and maybe some other stuff at the end. Uh, so, late last week, the State Department of Education released updated information on their Maryland School Report Card website. In particular, they released updated star ratings where schools are rated on a scale of one to five. Across the state, on average, schools went down compared to the ratings from three years ago. 
when you average the ratings from all schools in each district, only two school districts went up in rating. Carrot in Queen Anne's County. Looking at how Harford is doing overall, in the 2019 ratings, Harford ranked 11th in the state on average star ratings across all levels. In the new ratings based on 2022 data, Harford now ranks 9th in the state. So overall, HCPS is doing well. Looking deeper, we had seven schools go up by one in rating while 11 schools went down. Uh, of concern, six of the 11 schools that went down were high schools. All but one of those went from a rating of five out of five to four out of five. So the high school level is a concern, but at both the elementary and middle school level, HCPS went up on average, although minimally. Again, the state average was for schools to go down in ratings at all levels. Um, two caveats. First, I actually got my data from the Baltimore Banners website because the state DOE doesn't appear to have added the star ranking data to their data download page yet. Second, I am double counting schools that are listed as combined middle school, uh, sorry, middle and elementary or middle and high school. Um, so another topic, because the capital budget is on the agenda again, please remember that our school system has what is effectively a structural deficit with respect to our school buildings. Our schools are aging faster than we are renovating or replacing them. We are building up a debt of overdue renovations at the same time that our county leadership is celebrating low taxes. Thank you. Good evening. You are now in the Board of Education meeting. Before you begin your public comment, please state your first and last name. Your time will conclude in three minutes. You will hear a bell ring when you have 30 seconds remaining. Please introduce yourself and you may begin your public comment now. Good evening. I am Crystal Don Park. Thank you for this opportunity to exercise my First Amendment and chime in with my opinion. It's Women's History Month. It is vital that our children are taught that a woman's place is anywhere they desire. In my lifetime, women required permission from a man to exercise basic daily activity, activities of life, servitude, property, certainly not liberty. In education, women have held positions historically in greater numbers. It was deemed appropriate by a patriarchal society. Please continue to hire diverse populations so our children witness not only representation of themselves, but women different from those that may be in their homes. Continue to build curriculums that are diverse, libraries and experiences that reflect and represent all. Girls and women that are labeled as aggressive are assertive. If they're labeled bossy, they're leaders. If they're difficult, they're speaking truth. If they're too much, they're visionary. Awkward, asking hard questions. And if they're well behaved, well, those aren't the ones changing history. Do not dim your light for anyone illuminate. We see you, we hear you, we value you, and we need you. Shine on and let the fools wear their sunglasses. There are rules for attendance and public comment, and we have young children at home. Please enforce your rules. Lastly, please notify the public if you change a scheduled meeting or cancel it without notice. You're wasting our time. Harford stands against hate. Black Lives Matter. Love is love. Good night. Dr. Mueller, that concludes um, the virtual public comment for this evening.